Cakes folks, welcome back to the channel. Today we're here to do my wrap up of everything I've read so far this year. I've not been doing a very good job of tracking how much I've read so far, but I have been doing a pretty good job of actually reading. So I think it's going to be quite a nice surprise at the end to add up how many books I read over the winter. The first book I read this year was Red Dust by Yoss, which is translated from the original Spanish by David Fire. So this is a book that would be amazing if you're a big fan of Douglas Adams. It's basically like a space opera cop, buddy cop movie, um, but in a book form. And it was a really fun way to start the year. Like it wasn't very serious. It had all those good sci-fi tropes that you love, kind of like time distortions, traveling to a little port asteroid. It was just absolutely fab. Two reluctant pals end up kind of investigating together. It was a really solid read, really fun. I gave it three and a half stars. Then I read Art Matters by Neil Gaiman, which will. Um, my friend gave me this for Christmas and it's just a little manifesto about all the reasons art matters, funnily enough. Uh, and it was just a really nice read, best enjoyed with a cup of tea and a custard cream, very affirming for people who make things and are insecure about how they make things. Who could that be? <laughs> And I gave that one four stars. Then I read another one of my beautiful, beautiful charcoal press editions, which was The Brickmakers by Salva Almada, translated by Annie McDermott. Uh, Almada is an Argentinian writer. I've been having a lot of luck with the Argentinian writers in the charcoal press catalogue. Sorry, I'm looking at them <laughs> as if they can hear me praise them. This follows two families who, as the title suggests, their trade is brickmaking and there is some kind of feud happening between these two families. This enmity between the two houses, can you see what parallels I'm drawing to some intertextuality here? It's very queer Romeo and Juliet, it's West Side Story could never. It so beautifully manages to evoke this hot, arid, sweaty, tired community and just kind of the closeness of people and just the sense of being curtain twitched on people watching the whole community knowing what you're up to knowing your whole family history and not being able to do anything without the wrong people finding out it was just absolutely stunning obviously easy five stars and i enjoyed it so much that i went out and picked up all the selva armada books that charcoal have <laughs> like i was just like yeah perfect sign me up straight into another five star read consider her ways by john windham this isn't actually a novel it's a short story collection Normally I don't rate those terribly highly because there's always one or two that I detest. But like this, it kind of snapped, but not in the way I think Wyndham intended it to snap. So the title story, Consider Her Ways, is about a woman who is taking some drugs in a hospital as part of a trial and woken up in an alternate universe where there are only women and the women are kind of speciated. So very Handmaid's Tale-esque, but better kind of their bodies have become amorphous and changed to suit the role they're given in society. And she wakes up as a mother who is this huge hulking machine with them trial-bearing hips, just baby, baby, baby. That's what they're built for. Um, and it's snapped in like a post-patriarchy, kill all the men, society of Amazons kind of way. I don't think that's what he was going for. I think he was going for the like sexual love of a man makes us human kind of way. But um Take the five stars where you can get them, Wyndham. Take them. The other stories in here snapped. Some of them were a little bit repetitive. There was lots of kind of, I got flung forward or backwards in time and told someone something and then it came back to bite me on the arse later. Um, but they were all really good. <laughs> it was repetitively good. Next up, I read one of the darlings of Bookstagram, which is Sheet of the Mountains. It was written by Vivek Schreer. It's a very short little book, but oh my God. <laughs> it was beautiful. It had me in tears. It's a coming of age story that's told in this beautiful prose poetry, maybe just straight up poetry, very kind of visual, very experimental, very stream of consciousness it's about a little boy who is bullied for being gay and we watch him kind of start to wonder if maybe that is his identity and start to claim that identity and own it but then he falls in love with a woman and kind of what that really means for him and where this word queer comes in and what the connotations of that are and it's all those themes that a queer person will 100% see and identify with and just be captivated by i really think this is probably one of the best books i've ever read easily needless to say five stars 
The reason I gave up on booktube was because I discovered Dungeons and Dragons and I can only cope with one hyperfixation at once. And we discovered that through, of course, Critical Role. If you don't know, it's a d and actual play podcast, which means a bunch of voice actors sit and play Dungeons and Dragons on stream and we watch it and we love it and they made a TV show of it. Go watch. But they've recently been releasing some little books to support the characters from their second campaign, which is my favourite. Um, so this is just the origin story of one of the characters, Jester. And you know what? It did what it needed to do. It told me where she came from. It gave me her backstory. The art style was cute. She was cute. Can you tell I think she's cute? 3.75 stars. Then a couple of weeks later, the new edition of that series came out. Caleb Widogast. He is my sad little wizard boy. Um, beautiful, incredible, exactly the same story. Uh, 3.75 stars, again, did a very good job of what it was meant to do. Then, Tone Shift, another short story collection. A classic one, Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield. Honestly, I was kind of shook by this. I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did. It was very much, um, darling, fetch me the parasol, strike up the band, the gazebo is ready. But it did an excellent job of balancing those excesses of the wealthy with the communities that were surrounding them and how they didn't have those things. So I think this was quite an interesting take on that kind of upper gentry garden party in the sun kind of vibe. I gave it a cheeky little four stars. I was really, really pleasantly surprised by it. Dead Astronauts by Jeff Vandermeer. Jeff Vandermeer, fantastic author. This was beautiful. It follows three dead astronauts jumping through parallel universes in an attempt to defeat this conglomeration known as the city. And all the way through you've got these beautiful, beautiful images repeating of kind of the death and rebirth of nature, of huge beasts, of spectral foxes. All of it reads like a fever dream on a trip on out-of-date painkillers on Mars. <laughs> and you're never really sure which timeline you're in, which universe you're in who anyone is to anybody else. It's just mind-blowing. And I didn't understand a fucking word of it. And that's what I look for in a book, five stars. Then I read The Employees, a workplace novel for the 22nd century. It is a translated work, written by Olga Raven and translated from the Dutch by Martin Artkin. Again, it was a trippy one. We are following some kind of colony or space station where humans work alongside AIs in human-esque bodies and the segregation that occurs when you have two groups of people who you do not consider to both be people <laughs> and their purpose on this workstation is to do with collecting objects that come in all different shapes sizes that they found on this planet's surface and nobody really knows what they are what they do and they have these strange effects on people so people weep when they see them people are desperate to be close to them some people are haunted by them or they trigger dreams in some people um, and as we are going through these transcripts of meetings between an investigative bureau and staff members we start to see that something has gone wrong on the ship and we slowly start to tease apart what the objects are there for versus this terrible thing that happened um, and I won't tell you any more than that because to be honest you don't find out a terrible amount more than that but again, I was so here for that. Five stars, loved it. Next up is one that I've been saying all over on Instagram. It is Tender is the Flesh by Augustina Bazterica. Translated from the Spanish by Sarah Moses. This book is set after um, a pandemic in animals. Basically makes them toxic and dangerous to humans. So if you get bitten by an animal, you will die. If you eat an animal, you will die. And at first it's like, well, hey, victory to the vegans. And then it gets kind of quite sinister as people start cannibalizing other people. And it just shows how quickly a government can condone and put in place structures to dehumanize huge parts of the society that they are in and make them food. <laughs> And it was really disturbing like really really disturbing i couldn't sleep for like two nights after i read this because you can just 100 percent see how real this is and it kind of talked about how the situation was different in other parts of the world and how people reacted to it 
um, and it just really shot a light on that kind of late capitalist American consumer kind of mindset. Mm -hmm, just five stars. Right, right, you fuckers. You made me read last year. Last year, you made me read one last stop. And yes, I loved it, but that's not the point. I didn't want to read it. If you have read one last stop and you've not read last night at the Telegraph Club, I don't know who you are, I don't know what you're doing. Because this is the exact same vibe. It's set in San Francisco in the 50s. We occasionally flip earlier and later in people's timelines, but we're mostly following <laughs> the seagulls are so loud. We're following the 1950s. We are following an Asian American girl and her kind of awakening and learning about the queer subculture in San Francisco at this little place called the Telegraph Club which has one of my favourite, favourite historical fiction tropes. The lady who dresses like a man and performs. It's got this really tender, slow building romance. It really shows the conflict that the main character's in and it just gives you a real insight into a community at a very specific point in time. Loved it. Five stars, I think, for this one too. Then we started to get into the swing of Queer History Month, so I started picking up a lot of queer non-fiction. First I picked up a biography of Bessie Smith by Jackie Kay, neither of who I had heard of, which I think is a bad thing to admit before I picked this up, but Jackie Kay is a poet and a novelist who loves jazz music and looking back through her own personal history and finding that this singer Bessie Smith was always there playing in the background of her memories was this really beautiful way to draw us in. So even if we didn't know Bessie Smith, it was important to us because it was so important to her. And Bessie Smith was a woman of colour, a singer, a queer woman, although at the time we couldn't use the words for it. It talked about her relationships with men and women, her life, her history, her performances, her rise and her fall again. And I'm not going to lie, I put on a bit of Bessie Smith. It moved me. I gave this one a 4.25 stars. Then I picked up Forbidden Lives, LGBT stories from Wales. Um, I am half Welsh and Narina Shopland. Um, I feel like she wrote this for me. It reads like a textbook, which I know some people would hate, but I kind of love. It was like, you are here to learn about Welsh queers. <laughs> you will bloody learn about the Welsh queers. So yes, half Welsh girly, love hearing more about Welsh history. It's always something I found really fascinating because Wales holds so much queer history specifically. The next two I'm going to kind of show you simultaneously. Uh, David Bowie Made Me Gay by Daryl W. Bullock and Good As You, 30 Years of Gay Britain by Paul Flynn. So these are both very similar. This is why I struggled to rate them. They both kind of look at roughly the same period of time. I mean this one says it goes over 100 years of queer music. It gets a lot more detailed once you get into the timelines that this book covers. So I found it quite repetitive to read both, but they've also both been on my TBR for so long that if I didn't, I was never going to get to them. <sighs> like, they were good at their jobs. If you are really into the history of music, this would be a shout for you. If you just want to start your journey of learning about queer history, this is the one for you. But I just could not get past the fact that there was like an overriding white cis gay man privilege to these. They didn't feel terribly intersectional. Like, you can't both start your books by talking about Bronsky Beat and expect me to think gay men have nuanced voices. I, I mean, I get it. I love Tell Me Why. I really do. But like... I gave this three stars because it felt very introductory and I gave this three point five stars. I'm putting them down now. Then I did a reread of The Good Immigrant, edited by Nika Shukla with my friends Amy and Rachel. On these being lessons for white people, it's created this space, or Nika Shukla created this space, where people could unabashedly be really pissed off about this dreadful, awful country and the way we treat people, and the ignorance of people, and also could just celebrate being people of colour. They could just celebrate being immigrants to this country, celebrate what their families had gone through, celebrate the good and the bad and just kind of have this joyous moment. Um, so obviously I rate it five stars again. So then I had a little week of reading translated fiction and what I picked up was this vintage Mishima. The full name is Yukio Oshima and it was translated from the Japanese by John Nathan. 
This book I gave two stars, and let me tell you for why. It was a terrible story, beautifully told. Like it read like a fairy tale, it read like an oral history that had been passed down. It follows a boy and his mother as a sailor kind of comes into their life and becomes a permanent fixture of their life and how in doing so the boy loses respect for him and the consequences that has. Very short book, quite a grim book in places, I had to skim read it because it got a little bit gory. Most of the fear it induced was in the implication and in the things that would have happened if it had continued. It's two stars, probably a great book for someone else, not a great book for me. Then I read Sweet Bean Paste by Jurian Sukagawa, translated by Alison Watts from the original Japanese. I love a cheeky little slice of life Japanese story. I feel like this had more to it than a lot of the other ones I've read. Normally it's just very slow, very quiet, nothing happens, we're just watching the life of these people. Fine, love it. But I feel like this one had some commentary behind it. One of the characters has um, an illness that is very highly stigmatised around the world, particularly in Japan, and was treated very badly about it. But it also has this kind of theme of intergenerational friendship, it's got that cute bakery aesthetic, and it is really heavily invested in talking about how atrocities are reflected in architecture, how nature is used to offset that and help people heal, and it's just got such a powerful use of trauma it doesn't feel like it's attacking us with the trauma it uses it to inform us and it was absolutely stunning i can't remember how many stars i gave this i think this was four or 4.5 stars for me oh then corker of a book i read till by daniel kelman translated by ross benjamin till is a character from germanic folklore and what the author has very cleverly done is taken this character and plonked him into the Great Germanic Wars as kind of a metaphor to talk about the violence that was being wrought across the country in that time. It's really disturbing. It's like a fairy tale in the grimmest, darkest understanding of that word. It's winding and haunting and spiritual and terrifying and it's just absolutely beautiful. And I wasn't expecting that from it at all. I was expecting something fine and a bit creepy. Uh, if you've read this, the scene where they go to pick him up from the forest. Terrifying, haunting shit. Then finally, 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 I read A Close and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers. Solid five stars. I loved Long Way to an Angry Planet when I read it like six years ago. But then everyone was like, oh, the sequel's not that good. It doesn't even follow the same people. So I never bothered to read it. Joke's on me. You fooled me because this is a beautiful book. This follows Lovelace, the AI from the ship. She gains an autonomous body, gains her personhood and kind of goes out into the world. Yet again, it's one of those little trading asteroid moon planet things that I love. It's that trope. And we just watch her kind of have to overcome her programming to accept who she is. Lots of very queer overtones and connotations, obviously. And what I think Becky Chambers does so well is just really naturally integrate world building and the way she explains these incredible alien races she's come up with without it feeling like a Tolkien lecture. Like at no point does she sit down and say, so let me tell you about the Aelons, like in the first three pages of The Hobbit, Tolkien sits down and says, so let me tell you about orcs and you immediately want to kill yourself. And we go to festivals, we travel across planets, we see all these different races, we have this really deep seated philosophical debate going through the whole book of what makes her a person or just a computer system. I think we've done it. As far as I'm aware, that is all of the books I've read so far this year. Which is I think about 20 books, which for me, this early in the year, I'm not mad about it. Thank you so much for watching, this is probably going to be a beast of a video. I hope you had a great start to your reading year and if not, that's okay. Let me know what you've been reading in the comments or if you had any thoughts about any of these books that I've now chucked across my bed. Because I'd love to hear what you thought. I'll catch you again very soon. Bye. Hello.